And now, from the great state of Mississauga in Ontario, Canada, it's the Ted Wallachin Podcast. Brought to you by Tom's Place, for the finest in men's fashion. Tom's Place will suit you. And ETP Canada, providing a state administration with ease. ETP Canada. And now, here's Ted. Thanks so much, Becky, and welcome everybody to another episode. I'm Ted Wallachin. Thank you for joining us. Back in June of this year, Olivia Chow was elected mayor of Toronto, becoming the 66th person to hold this prestigious position. And while Toronto has been led by many very bright, caring, and strong leaders, we've also elected, in the words of the Toronto Star newspaper, scoundrels, rogues, and socialists. Author Mark Maloney has done a wonderful job chronicling the history of this city's rulers in his book, Toronto Mayors, A History of the City's Leaders. He joins me now. Mark Maloney, welcome. It's nice to meet you, sir. I appreciate you taking the time. Thank you, Ted. Um, I don't know whether it's because it seemingly um, our history, well, at least when I was taught history growing up and going through uh, the educational system, never seemed to be very interesting. It always seemed to... Uh, be uh, subdued and maybe even boring, comparatively speaking, uh, uh, against uh, the United States. And yet, uh, in reading through your book here, um, we've had some fascinating characters who have run this city of Toronto, yes, to yes. say the least, and not not in a nice way in some in, in some cases. When you were when you first sat down to, to research the book, what was the first thing that that, that first story or the first episode that, that came across to you as being shocking? Uh, I think the first one that was truly shocking was the mayor who conducted human torture on an opposition candidate. And by <laughs> human torture, I, I actually verified that with Amnesty International and said, you know, this is what they did. Do you define that in today's terms as torture? And they said, oh, yes. Um, what happened was it, it was a, a mayor, it was way, way back uh, in the 1800s, early 1800s, and um, he did a tar and feathering. And while that may sound kind of benign, what it is is you you basically take the opposition or the the opponent that you have or the person that you've targeted, you beat them to a pulp, you get them on the ground, uh, beaten, uh, you strip them, you then uh, pour burning molten pine tar on them, and then roll them around in chicken feathers. And then what happens is when it essentially days later dries, um, they're picking off the chicken feathers, but they're picking off their own skin. So it's human torture. Uh, and and you had to ask Amnesty International if they thought that was torture? Well, I, I just wanted to verify <laughs> that it, it is indeed, like, yeah. I, I knew it was torture, but like, so does the rest of the world. But now Toronto knows it as torture and that a former mayor did this. And who was this mayor? And, and give, give me a timeline. Uh, this is back. In, the, the actual incident happened in the 1820s, but it, he didn't become mayor. On It was an opposition candidate, but uh, he didn't become mayor until the 40s. His name was George Garnett. Mm-hmm. So we haven't named any streets after him or put up any statues or anything. We no. don't have to start tearing down. The, no, and thankfully. The, the other one that was shocking to me, and I, I uncovered this research. Nobody had ever written about it, or it seems that they hadn't discovered it. Um, we had a Mayor Samuel Harmon. And Samuel Harmon, um, he owned over 140 slaves. And um, what happened was he was a young um, British guy. His dad was a very important uh, British official, and his dad was appointed to become the Chancellor of the Exchequer in the Caribbean uh, colonies. So he moved as a young man to Antigua. But the Harmon family had like roots in Antigua as well, and so for several generations they had a an estate called the Harmon Estate. And um, Samuel, though he was born in Britain and did some of his schooling in Britain, he was brought up in Antigua as a young man uh, in a society that, you know, was slaves were doing all his bidding as as a 
living in the la life of luxury. But then um, he he inherited the Harmon estate. So he had 148 slaves, and this was documented through the Almanac of Antigua. So I checked into it with officials in Antigua. And uh, sure enough, uh, he, he was our slave-owning mayor. And they were doing back-breaking work uh, 12 hours a day in the hot sun. They were they were mistreated, misused. They were in, in terrible shape, you know, with disease. And uh, he was the owner of the estate. Let's talk about uh, the secret highway that existed in, in the King Edward Hotel. This is a fascinating story, which if, if it happened today, would would be uh, exposed in, in all, the, all of the major newspapers and, and would call for the downfall of anybody involved in it, but not necessarily back then. Yes, what happened was um, we had a, um, a, a mayor who, had a, I guess I would call him a lovable scoundrel. Um, <laughs> his name was uh, Alan Lamport, and we have named the stadium after him. Yes. Um, but he, he, <laughs> what he did was when he became mayor, he went to the Royal York hotel and he got them to donate a suite of rooms for him. Um, and the, for free, uh, on the proviso that he spend liberally on, uh, parties, on entertaining, on room service, on you name it. So he, what he did was he registered the name. Uh, a suite in in the name of the city clerk, not in his name. And for two years, he partied. He had drink, champagne, cocktail, liqueurs, steaks, you know, fresh cigars, flowers, you name it, in the suite. And uh, he did this for two years. And when the bills came in to the city, the city clerk, George Wheel, was so afraid of losing his job, he just paid the bills. But you see, Alan had not asked for any council <laughs> permission. He had not asked for any council uh, authority or approval to do this. So when the bills came in, if you took the figure of $1954 and put it to today, it was $500,000 in parties with no yeah. council approvals. <laughs> So wow. if, if a mayor did that today, they would be run out of town. Yeah. <laughs> kind of makes the uh, prime minister $6,000 a night suite in, in England look, look like a, a walk in the park, huh? Yeah. It, uh, and it was, this was at the Royal York Hotel. I think I said the King Edward Hotel. The, the, um, there, I went and actually looked at the suite. It's still there. 1735 on the 17th floor, looking over to the words, the lake and to the west. Yeah. It's, it's a lovely suite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I guess I guess so. Uh, well, the process of electing mayors uh, in, in Toronto, how has that changed over the years? Well, um, it, in the very, very beginning, um, the mayors, yes, were appointed by members of council. But then in, um, in 1859, it became an elected position and has been elected ever since. What has changed is uh, between the founding of our city in 1834, ran right up till 1956, the term of council was just one year. So the actual election day uh, in the old days used to be on New Year's Day. So people would go and get rip-roaring drunk Whoa. on New Year's Eve, and then they'd go and vote the next day. Wow. And for years, the voting, the first 40 years of our city, the first 40 years, um, the voting was in public. You had to go to essentially a, it was a bar or some public place and you had mm -hmm. to, you know, say it publicly who you were voting for. So the, the actual paper ballot, secret ballot didn't come in until the 1870s. So that has changed. What has changed also is the, the term uh, it's no longer a one-year term. It's it's gone. It's it alternated. In some years, it was two years. Then it went to three. Then it, and under Premier McGinty, he turned it into a four-year term. So it's now a four-year, not a one-year. When 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 people used to vote on New Year's Day, what kind of a turnout would they have? Well, it, it, you have to also keep in mind Toronto was a very small small community in those sure. days. So you would have a mayor 
like William Lyon McKenzie, who was our first mayor, who was elected just with a couple of hundred votes. And then he was then appointed um, by the council to be mayor. So you had a mayor who literally, in a community at that time of 9,300 when we were founded as a city, a mayor who was elected just with a couple of hundred votes. Wow. Three women have been elected mayor in the city of Toronto, correct? Yes, that's right. Yeah, we've had June Rollins, a very dynamic woman in a trailblazer in her time. She she was the first woman to sit on the board of the TTC, which is, you know, today you think, well, that's, that's kind of, you know, unusual, the first woman. But that was the day. Um, she then became, she was a very active councillor, very popular, and became chair of the police police commission, uh, which is now called the Police Services Board, but she chaired the police commission before um, becoming mayor. Um, she then uh, ran against Barbara Hall, who was a, a lawyer, well-regarded community activist, and so Barbara Hall beat June Rollins for the mayoralty. It was the first time where you had two, the two leading candidates uh, were women at, right. at the time. That hadn't happened before. So Barbara won. She was a first-term uh, mayor, and uh, she lost then to Mel Lastman when Amalgamation came in. And then since then, uh, Olivia Chow is our third mayor. The first, first person who is um, a mayor who is not from um, kind of the background of uh, the British Isles and... Uh, or Canada. Um, so it, it's the first person who has, you know, become a visible minority in our city. Uh, as you know, in, in we will be turning 190 uh, in next uh, year, mm-hmm. in March, as a city. Uh, so it's the first time a, a non white uh, mayor has been elected. Mm-hmm. Yeah, which, which which is interesting because it, it doesn't reflect our population. No, not at all. Not at all. No, that's a very good point. Now, June June Rollins was, was she not the ones uh, who banned uh, the the group Bare Naked Ladies from performing at Nathan Phillips Square because she thought that they were objectifying women? Yes, but you know the problem is June got a a bad rap for that. Um, June was not the person who made that decision. It was. Mm-hmm. A, city staff in the city clerk's department in the protocol office who made that decision. She didn't have any part of it. And in fact, she was away um, traveling when that decision was made, but she took the rap for it. Yeah. Unfairly, I think. Yeah. Yeah. No kidding. Uh, Let's talk about um, some of the more, more colorful characters. Uh, John Sewell is one that pops into, into my mind. Yes. Well, jo- John, my, my favorite story about John was, unfortunately, it had to be edited out of the book just because of space reasons. There was a whole lot of stories that I would have loved to include. But my favorite John Sewell story was years ago, uh, well before the internet and well before Twitter and all of that stuff, um, there was a radio station, CHFI, who had a contest. And The contest was they would pay 50 bucks to the first person who could come into the station in person with a picture of John Sewell smiling. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So that's funny. Yeah. So he was a urban reformer. Like he was a a rebel. He was uh, wanted to fight the old guard and, and, you know, he, he had a certain way about him that was, um, Quite, quite uh, colorful in in his day, yeah. And even after his, if I recall correctly, after his tenure as mayor, he became quite the thorn in the side of the Mike Harris government. Oh yeah, and he's been a thorn in the side of uh, of probably every PC government since then. Yeah, he, he. But you know, he's also done some very um, good work. Um, not everybody will agree with it, but he's he's been on the whole issue of police accountability and police reform and that, you know, we need to be more transparent with our police services and how they operate and what they do. 
so he he has done that. He also led the um, movement uh, to try and stop amalgamation. He didn't think that amalgamation was the best route for Toronto. And so he led this whole movement in the community to try and uh, not bring about the fusion of Toronto and the suburbs. Now, Mel Lastman, there's, there's another mayor I think who got a, a bad rap because he's known as the man who called in called in the army because of a, a major snowstorm that hit Toronto. But people will argue with you that, that, in fact, the streets were so clogged in some of the older areas of Toronto, the smaller streets, that had an, an emergency broken out on any of those streets, an emergency vehicle would not have been able to make it down those streets yeah. because, of the, because of the parking situation and, and the accumulation of snow. Absolutely right. Um, I happened to be working in the mayor's office for Mel when that storm happened. And, uh, you know, we, we were put onto a complete emergency mode. Like we were taking crisis calls. You know, I was answering calls like you wouldn't believe. And um, I think he did get a bad rap for it because we were on a lifeline. Like the snow was so bad that um, we, we were almost crippled as a city, like crippled to the point where our, our, our entire subway system was going to be shut down. And we, the, the vehicles that he brought in, the army vehicles, actually did save people. Like we, we documented that. They did save lives because they were able to get the vehicles down certain streets. So I don't think... It, it was the worst storm that the city has ever had. And mm-hmm. it, it, it was in, in successive waves. So it, it had a, a terrible effect. And um, I think he did the right thing. Rob Ford was probably the most colorful mayor in the city in, in, modern, in modern times, to say the least. And unfortunately, not under good circumstances. Um, Rob, Rob, Rob was a very complex figure. Um, you know, people loved him or they didn't love him, but he was a very um, much a retail politician. He loved the retail politics of looking after constituents. And, and you know, he would, um, he, he gave me an interview one time and, and he said that, you know, he loved hearing from constituents and he would phone them back and he had only one rule is that he wouldn't phone them back after 11 o'clock at night. <laughs> so, but um, he was the mayor of Toronto who is probably known the, the most around the world Yeah. Um, under sad circumstances, uh, you know, re- regretfully, uh, but he was a very affable mayor. Uh, people to this day speak about him. They like him. Uh, they, they consider that uh, he was, and he actually started a movement, the Ford Nation movement, and that's very rare in a, a mayor or, a, you know, a mayoralty candidate to, to actually begin a movement, but he did, and it continues to this day. Ted Wallison returns in a moment. Have you been tasked with the role of a state executor or expected maybe in the future you will be? Well, if so, let me make your life a lot simpler by introducing you to my friend Debbie Stanley. Debbie is the founder of ETP Canada. They specialize in estate administration. Their goal simply is to help Canadian executors understand their role and how to deal with the loved one's estate. Let's face it, there's no school for this. But ETP Canada offers services such as executor support, estate accounting, and they have a new online course called Executor Ready. It's an engaging video designed to make estate administration easier and affordable. And those are two comforting thoughts during a stressful time. So call Debbie Stanley at one 866 309-0387, that's one 309 387 or you can get her at info at etpcanada.ca, that's info at etpcanada.ca. Hey, it's Ted Wallace and for Tom's Place, our fall merchandise is starting to arrive and we've got massive amounts of summer clothing that needs to be cleared. Blowout prices on virtually everything. Like designer suits, regularly up to $5.99 now from $167 to $267. 
beautiful sports jackets, starting at only one sixty-seven, and designer dress pants and shirts, all at sixty-seven dollars. Check out our deals throughout the store on the very best of designer menswear. Huge savings off our already below retail prices. If you need a suit for an upcoming wedding or any special occasion, we are Toronto's one-stop suit shop. For the finest outfit for every occasion, there is no better time to find the perfect addition to your wardrobe. Tom's Place is open daily, 11 to 6 weekdays, 10 to 5 Saturday, and 12 to 5 on Sunday. Visit Tom's Place, 190 Baldwin in Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. Now back to Ted Wallachan. Let's talk about, um, sadly, the, the mayors who, who, who passed in office. I remember um, uh, Donald so- uh, Somerville. Donald Som- Somerville was Playing a hockey. really good mayor. He was a very, very fine person. He was well-regarded, uh, respected, hard-working guy, young, kind of very dynamic guy. Uh, and Don, you know, have to remember, he won the mayoralty having won against Nathan Phillips, who was one of our beloved mayors. And But I think what happened was Nathan, you know, was there many years and he kind of, you know, got old and tired in, in a, a certain way. And uh, Donald Somerville came along as a young, vigorous, with it guy, and he won. And he won a huge majority in that election. What happened was he worked himself to the bone. He was working 12, 18 hour days and he and he was at a charity hockey event and it was uh, to raise uh, money uh, for earthquake relief um, for a, a town in Italy and he died right on the spot of a massive heart attack on, on the ice at the hockey game and uh, it was a Arena. and his funeral actually Ironically, strangely, his funeral that was held uh, was was on the same day of the John Kennedy assassination uh, in 63. So while yeah. the funeral was going on, rippling through the audience and through the, the people in the church were the, was the news that Kennedy had just been assassinated. So it was yeah. a sad, sad time. How many mayors did pass in office? Uh, two. Um, the, the, um, the other one was, uh, McBride and he was in 1936. He died of an illness. He was the first one to die in office. There have been, uh, just McBride and Somerville, uh, Rob Ford, when he died, uh, the city treated him as if he was the mayor, even though he wasn't at the time. Uh, they gave him a, like a, what, the equivalent of a state funeral for, civic funeral um, in recognition of his time as mayor. And that was courtesy of John Tory, who was mayor at the time, right? That's right, yeah. It's ironic how John Tory was the man who came in to rescue the image of the mayor's office in Toronto and um, did so for two terms and then in a third term left his office because of an illicit affair that he was having. Yes, John, I think you have to put into the context, though, of um, when when we had the pandemic, um, one thing I think we have to give John Tory credit for and, and remember is that he led us as a city through the pandemic. We had those terrible, terrible months from mm-hmm. 2020, 2021, right into 2022 of of people being at home, not knowing what was going on, being fearful. Uh, you know, it, it was a terrible time. And John was there day after day after day with Dr. Devella. I got to give them credit for the leadership yeah. they showed. Sure. And in that particular time, John and his office, you know, City Hall was empty. People were working from home. They weren't coming in. But John and his office did come in. And they worked like dogs. And I, I know that because I, I knew many of them. But then John, you know, his, his wife was away. Uh, she was in, in their place in Florida. He was working hard. And, you know, 
a relationship developed. Um, so it was something that he regrets. It's something that he wishes had not happened. But it's a very personal thing that, you know, one could understand and see that, you know, after long, long hours and working with someone, uh, the, you know, these things happen. Well, it's interesting because after he stepped down, many people said, you know, don't step down. You, you shouldn't step down. And in fact, polls showed that even though Olivia Chow took the lead from the outset of the election for the, the, uh, for the, for the new mayor of Toronto, uh, polls were indicating that had John Tory decided to run or uh, that he would have been favored by a long shot. Yeah, I honestly think um, had he stayed in and not resigned and, and, and um, I think he would have, I, I think he would have won again. Yes, I, I do believe that. And I think people were uh, very forgiving of him. Yeah. Um, I think they, yes, uh, having an illicit affair with a staffer is not something that one should do as mayor, I think. Uh, but he acknowledged that and he took the consequences and he, you know, he respected the job in order, you know, but by resigning. But I think he would have won because the people, you know, he, he was polling in the, in the range of, you know, 60%. And um, he had won a very convincing election. Um, so I think people would have forgiven him, yeah. You know what I find it's interesting? Um, the juxtaposition between himself and Premier Ford, because Premier Ford wanted to be the mayor of Toronto, John Tory wanted That's to be right. the Premier of Ontario, and they yep. ended up with, with the opposite jobs. That's right. Yeah, and it's very ironic that way. And, yeah. uh, you know, it, 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 and yet, you know, ironically, they, you know, in the beginning, maybe didn't have the greatest of relationships, but I think they forged uh, a relationship that was positive and constructive and that worked uh, for both of them. You know, they, in a way, I guess you could put it, they needed each other. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. But it, but it worked, actually. And, and Ford, you know, came to respect John. And John did the same with Ford. And they would communicate, like, all the time. Like, they, you know, they would text each other. They would talk. They, you know. Like, I think in, in, in my time, in our time, Mark, one of the most beloved mayors of this, this city had would have been uh, David Crombie, the tiny perfect mayor. Yeah. I think of all the mayors that I did the research on, I have to agree with you. I think David Crombie is the beloved mayor of Toronto. And it's a combination of uh, different factors. It, it, it was a combination of the time. It was a combination of his very, very great ability to communicate and to relate to people. Um, it was a combination of the issues of the day that he was kind of taking a reform attitude to to uh, stop some of the, you know, unchecked development in the city. So for, I think for many reasons, um, he was the right person at the right time in the right place. And people loved him and they still talk about him to this day. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I, you know, I, I, I've seen him on a couple of occasions um, and you know, people literally come up to him like 40 and 50 years later and and say how much they loved him, you know. So. Well, you know, you, it, when you ask people what, what their memories of, of David Crombie are, not, not, one people, not one person can, that I've spoken to can come up with anything negative in terms of scandalous. Yeah, yeah. And I got to tell you something about the character of a person. Um, and I think, David Crombie typifies this is that his wife, and he's spoken very publicly about this. His wife has had dementia and she lives in a nursing home on college in the Kensington nursing home. And he told me the other day um, that his wife has not recognized him or does not know who he is. And that's, been 15 years now 15 years wow but he still goes to see her like a couple of times a week and i think that is character that is yeah. that is a true 
expression of love of somebody that he would do that. And, and, you know, she has no idea who he is. It, it, it's an amazing story. I think. Let's talk about David Miller for a second, because he was, a. Uh, he really defined um, divisive politics, left versus right, in my opinion. Not, 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 not to say that he was bad or whether he was good, but there was a definite division there between what is a left-wing politician and what is a right-wing politician. Would you agree with that? Well, I think, uh, yes, to a certain degree. Um, but I think the, the problem, I shouldn't say it's a problem, but the challenge that he was facing is he wanted to, things to change. And when you have that kind of reform attitude and you want to come in and make those changes, um, you're, you're faced with some roadblocks. You're faced with uh, things that, you know, people don't want that kind of change. So one of the things, you know, in the last Manera, there was the, the famous scandal, the MFP scandal, as it was called, about uh, you computers. know computer leasing, and you had the city treasurer who was taking a you know a, the guest of a a contractor taking a jet to I think it was Philadelphia to, to you know see a hockey game and stuff like that stuff that would never be allowed today and isn't allowed, um, but there was no kind of ethics um, there there was no um, ombudsman, there was no um, integrity commissioner at the time. So David Miller did bring in a number of reforms. And, um, but yes, he had a certain style that, uh, you know, he was pretty direct, pretty blunt. And, you know, he was going to rule the roost. In, so. Yeah. Was there one politician that, that in your opinion, uh, didn't get the, the nearly the amount of respect that they should have? I know we've touched a little bit on some that do you think that were underrated or, you know, were given bad breaks by, by the public. There was a, a mayor um, who uh, I had ha in the research I've done um, developed a huge amount of respect for, um, but I think he's largely been forgotten in Toronto, but his name was Robert Saunders. He was mayor. Um, he was our post-war mayor. So he, started in 1945 he was mayor until 1948 but that guy i think um similar to crombie um was a guy that was just um an amazing figure he he had like elected communists on his council and yet you know he got along with them they liked them they worked with them you know he he brought uh, a whole story of inclusion to the office and working with a, a wide group of people, but he's largely been forgotten. Um, but he, you know, I think that guy could have become prime minister of Canada had he lived. Anyways. Interesting. It's, it's a fascinating book and, and, and it really is a, um, an eye opener for people who think that, that we live in, that our history is kind of boring because uh, there have been some very colorful, as I mentioned at the outset, very colorful uh, characters who have um, sat in the mayor's chair in, we have in, a, in the city. A guy who, um, you know, he had uh, 18 children. Uh, oh. and, and, and I'm thinking, 18 children? Holy gee. And he was always crying poor, but yet he, he died on a European vacation, <laughs> a luxury vacation, but minus the kids, of course. Yeah. 18 children by, by the yeah. same wife. Yeah. Yeah. And I did check that, you know, I, I was skeptical, like, you know, did he really have 18 children? So I, I contacted the Dictionary of Canadian Biography, who are a very legitimate historical source, and they confirmed that, he, yes, he did. So. Yeah. Fascinating. The book is called Toronto Mayors, A History of the City's Leaders. Mark Maloney, thanks very much for this. I appreciate it and all the best to you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ted.
Well, that's it for this week. And uh, thanks, as usual, to uh, Becky Coles and to Paul Gatt, my producers. And as usual, we invite you to check out our website. It's www.tedwalshyn.ca. You can check out past episodes. You can leave your comments and your questions and your thoughts. And also, there's links to our sponsors. So please drop by and, and say hello to us that way. And while you're online, make sure you fill out your organ and tissue donation card. You could change or even save a life. And by the way, the mayor with 18 children, we neglected to mention, so I'll mention, was a guy by the name of Henry Sherwood. Mr. Sherwood was mayor from 1842 to 1844. Fitting name for a man with 18 kids, Sherwood. Sure did. Have a great week. The Ted Wallace and Podcast has been brought to you by ETP Canada, providing estate administration with ease. And Tom's Place, for the finest in men's clothing at unbeatable prices. It's Tom's Place at 190 Baldwin in the heart of Kensington Market. Tom's Place will suit you. The Ted Wallace and Podcast is produced by Becky Coles. That's me. Technical production by Paul Gatt. Music by Bike Thieves. To talk to Ted and for more information on his podcast and our sponsors, go to www.tedwallishan.ca.